All right, we'll give everyone a, a few more minutes to join here, and then we will go ahead and get started with uh, panelist introductions. Really looking forward to a great event tonight between Anid and Within. We're very excited to uh, to partner for this. Us too. Thank you. Yes, hopefully it's our, the first of many partnerships with you all. <laughs> so uh, looking forward to this. All right, well, uh, I will go ahead and uh, kick things off. I am Jason Wood, the Marketing and Communications Manager for Anid. Uh, I only started a couple of months ago, so still new to the organization, but uh, back in 2020, I was diagnosed with an eating disorder, and I've turned that experience into a mission now to get out and to hopefully change the narrative around eating disorders and raise awareness, especially among males, uh, that eating disorders can happen to anyone. So uh, it was uh, really exciting to be able to put this event together with Within and uh, talk about the conversation that I think many of us have put off for far too long. Uh, with that being said, I will go ahead and pass it off to Sean, if you'd like to go ahead and introduce yourself to the audience. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for having us. We're really happy to be here. Um, my name is Sean Riebel. I am the Chief Nutrition Officer at Within Health. Um, yeah, and I have, um, my goodness, some lived experience, but also um, clinical experience and research experience with eating disorders. My story began back in um, 2004 when I went for my master's work and um, started looking at um, male cyclists and subclinical eating disorders. And I got into that because I grew up on Long Island, New York, and I, I share this story with a lot of our uh, teammates, but just that was into surfing with um, my dad and my family, and I still surf now, but like at that time I saw um, I saw a lot of things happen with my family and my, my friends and with drugs and alcohol. And I was like, I want to get into something healthier and um, went into cycling and little did I know about performance enhancing drug usage, as well as um, some of the weight stigma and some of the fat phobia that was um, present within, within that sport. And of course, you guys probably all know it on here. And even y'all that have joined us tonight have probably experienced some things or seen things um, with that in other sports as well. So that sparked my interest because I had the stereotype in my head, oh, this is just something that the girls struggle with, like who, who knew? And so um so I started studying that and then got into nutrition and the rest, rest is all history. Um, but yeah, eventually went for a PhD in nutrition and then studied eating behaviors in adolescents and their, and, um, and their parents and then full on um, in, in the eating disorder world. So yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for, for sharing that. And uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure getting to know you over the planning of this event. Uh, we'll, I'll go ahead and pass it off now to a guy who wears many hats, many titles. Uh, he reached out a couple of months ago to see how he could collaborate with Anid, and I'm super excited to welcome Ryan to the panel tonight. Ryan, did you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, hey gang, uh, Ryan Althaus. I'm out here in Santa Cruz, California, and uh, yeah, the different hats we got kind of, I'm a, I'm a sailboat captain out here and a minister. Uh, but I uh, kind of came to California by route of Kentucky, where I ended up, I ran the marathon professionally for a couple of years, got into the whole Ironman triathlon circuit. Uh, and that was kind of my second wave, actually. I first got into the eating disorder world by uh, uh, kind of my downfall at the end of high school cross country and ended up inpatient once when I was about 18 years old. Uh, Got my act together pretty well, had a really successful uh, academic, social, and athletic career for, for nearly 20 years, and then got knocked down by a bout of mono that right preceded the, the whole COVID pandemic and the isolation, and it sent me spiraling into a relapse that landed me uh, inpatient in the hospital again. Um, Long story short, through it all, uh, decided that I better put purpose to the pain. So I ended up uh, ended up writing a book, uh, and and it took off a little bit. So we're doing some fundraising right now for some different eating disorder initiatives. Through it, uh, the book's called "From Emaciated to Emancipated." Uh, kind of fun. Picked up a, a kind of a forward from Coach Belichick of the Patriots. 
which was uh which was pretty awesome uh just going to show how much yeah how much male mental health is a part of athletics so yeah ever since been on this kind of journey to bridge the spiritual side the athletic side and just the cognitive side of eating disorders i'm doing some coaching right now so uh guys can jump on my website it's called the surfing uh i'm another surfer now uh, i gave up my running shoes and my bicycle and exchanged it for yoga and a surfboard figured that was a little more healthy recovery move but uh but the the gist of it is um gosh still right heart in the middle of recovering from that relapse and and that's kind of where the book came in was just there was no there was no resources that had a present voice from somebody actually struggling uh, that I could find. So just thought that was kind of a neat opportunity to to share a, a voice that people can kind of sit back and go, yeah, me too. So looking forward to being a part of this. Uh, and yeah, I'll pass the stick on to the next. All right. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, the, as I was preparing for this event tonight, that thought ran through my mind when I was coming to terms with my eating disorder. There weren't other guys out there talking about it. There weren't other male providers out there. Uh, yeah. When I would search for different faces, it was always a, a female face that I was finding, and it made me feel really invisible. It made me feel alone, which is why I think having this conversation tonight is so cool that we're able to sit here, five guys, and talk about this topic. Uh, I will go ahead and pass it off now to Austin, who I've had the pleasure of knowing now for a couple of months. Uh, he recently submitted a blog post to the Anid blog, so definitely make sure to check that out if you have a chance. Austin, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yes, thanks. Thanks, Jason. Hey, team. Um, it's it's amazing. I'm getting goosebumps hearing some of your s stories already just from the panel uh, with very similar backgrounds as to how we view the world and the world views us. So I uh, appreciate you sharing that. Uh, my name is Austin Otaki. I'm here in Korea right now. I'm an active duty Army major in the Medical Service Corps. I've been in the Army for 12 years, happily married uh, with my wife and partner uh, with two boys. And um, I mean, that's the, that's the bluff. But as, it, as why I'm here with this panel um, I'm here because uh, even though I was only recently diagnosed, maybe I think 2020, 2021, uh, for having an eating disorder, specifically a purging disorder, uh, I, I successfully hid this for 10 years of my life, both a combination of hiding from others and I think a denial and hiding from myself. Um, and it wasn't uh, until others provided me a leg of support, uh, kind of uh, a comfort zone area, and, and you alluded to this, Jason, it's kind of, you kind of felt invisible. It wasn't until I, I was seen that I felt comfortable sharing. And I do a lot of work with the Arbinger Institute. And it was at one of our conferences with a small group of, of strangers that were so warm, welcoming, and sharing that I felt comfortable in this group of individuals who I've never met before to open up and share my eating challenges and what I've been battling through. That was the first time I ever came out in an open forum about what I was, what I was battling. Um, I even hid this from my wife for the 10 years of our marriage. And, and with that, I immediately, uh, in that small group, they, they encouraged me to, to take my story and put it to paper. Uh, and I felt motivated and encouraged to share if I can even, uh, my only attempts and with this panel and with that article is just to provide a safe space for others out there who are listening to, to know that there's people like us that, that we're here for you, we, we do exist. And, and this is a topic that, is, uh, that, that others are dealing with. Uh, and so my, my, my only agenda here is to provide a safe space for others to feel comfortable to share. Uh, so I, with that, I want to pass it on to the other panel members. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Austin. And last but certainly not least, we've got Dr. Sam Moss, who's joining us live from Cincinnati tonight. So uh, Sam, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure, sure. Thank you, Jason. Uh, you guys are tough to follow, I, I have to say. <laughs> um, so I'm uh, Sam Moss. I'm a psychiatrist by training. I'm the director of psychiatry at Within Health and Eating Disorder uh, Treatment Program um, for PHP and IOP levels of care. Um, I would say I'm here because Sean invited me. Sean is our <laughs> nutrition officer. Um, and my my experience with eating disorders, I think, has just been as a male uh, growing up in America. I did immigrate to America from the Middle East at a young age. And I I'm, I was always shocked by the some of the cultural expectations that um, are placed on 
men and women, but but in my in my experience as um, as a male, it, it's widely different from the way I grew up and the gym culture. And uh, again, so I mean, I was bullied as a child. Part of it was because I was just not into you know the the bro culture that I think I was expected to be into. Um, and that was very eye opening for me all the way until I went through my my psychiatry training and ended up meeting Dr. Oliver Pyatt and kind of uh, dove deep into the world of eating disorders. And um, it's been a journey and an explore, exploration, and I'm still learning, I would say, especially about um, how, um, and, and I don't necessarily want to gender it per se, but how other genders, other than what you would expect eating disorders, right? Uh, there's a stereotype of this is a female uh, kind of uh, disorder or diagnosis, but I'm, I'm exploring how other non-females experience eating disorders and how difficult it is to seek treatment uh, and not feel that there are all these barriers and areas of shame and, and just accessibility that that impact um, impact this uh, this condition. So I'm glad to be here and, and hopefully we can have some good good conversations and destigmatize um, eating disorders uh, in males. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining us and for all the panelists for introducing yourselves. And let's dive into that conversation. And uh, I think that's the perfect segue is stigma. That is, I think, the first barrier for a lot of men when it comes to uh, seeking the help that they deserve is getting through that stigma, whether it's around mental health in general or the stigma around eating disorders. So I wanted to open it up for discussion just to share your own experiences with the stigma, whether whether that's an individual lived experience with the stigma or possibly seeing that in patients that come through. Um, how do we break down that stigma? So um, yeah, I would love to uh, toss it out there and uh, hear what, what you gentlemen have to say. Hey, Jason, this is uh, Austin. I was, you know, I'll be the one, I guess, to start this off um, if you're okay with that. Uh, I'm very thankful uh, for having an opportunity to be introduced to the military because I think over time they've tried to very extensively break down the, the negative stigma towards seeking behavioral health as a platform for, for just care. But the, the challenge, uh, even in light of that, in light of the encouragement to seek out behavioral health as a routine touch point in our normal uh, physical and mental well being, I still think there's a massive challenge in. Uh, being comfortable with addressing eating disorders and everything that falls under that umbrella as a comfortable zone to even talk with your provider. So I'd, I'd actually say my experience is a separation there uh, because I'm one of those unique ones where I felt fully comfortable. I was utilizing behavioral health for routine touch points three to four times a year on all other issues, stress, anxiety, work-related issues, family. But at no point in 10 years of seeking care, did we ever address my eating disorder or did I ever feel comfortable talking about it because there was in the back of my head still this, uh, you know, this, I guess, unease that as a male, this is not a topic that is really worth addressing. Or maybe it's not even a problem because maybe everyone's going through this. There's just not a good face to represent the male or those that uh, the non-female gender, uh, as, as the doctor alluded to. Um, so I think that's, uh, you, you asked, how do we get at that? I think this is a starting point, right? I think I've seen a large, by, by introduction to you, Jason, and, and what your, your teams are doing, these the blogs, uh, these just types of discussions and us sharing this out, uh, letting the youth of America and other countries know, the adults know that this is not something they have to deal with alone and we can talk about it and they can seek out help. So I think this is the starting point. I'm happy to be a part of it. Um, open it up to to others. Yeah, I'll jump in. Um, gosh, yeah, coming out of uh, coming out of two rounds, it was really interesting. So like I alluded to, I, I had inpatient treatment back when I was 18. And then 20 years later, I had another round of inpatient treatment. And the the distance we've traveled is awesome. Uh, when I first jumped in, yeah, nobody was up for talking about males with eating disorders. Uh, I remember, yeah, it was a, it was kind of a running joke in the in the the local network. Whenever I said ED, yeah, everybody thought I was an 18 year old with erectile dysfunction, and uh, 
yeah, we've come a really long way. There's still a long way to go, but, but 20 years later, I think we're actually making some progress. Uh, I think one of the best things we can do is to kind of add some humor to the subject, to make it approachable, to make it, yeah, not, not quite so serious despite the severity of it. And, uh, yeah, I'm really kind of, kind of excited to see where this is all going. Um, but at the same time, yeah, it feels though it's, it's been an opportunity to get in touch with my feminine side and go to support groups where I'm the only guy and start getting comfortable with that too. So it goes both ways. It's, uh, it's kind of, yeah, put on us as well. So. That's a really good point. That's what I think. Oh, sorry. Who was somebody else calling in? I was, I say, Ryan, that's just a great point. I'm thinking of just how like owning it, you know, how like owning it can be such a, a big thing for us. And like when, I think, I think that's something even as men, like that we, that we might experience in, in life as well as like, okay, having that, like, you know, like that alpha male thing of like, oh, okay, you need to be like, you know, whatever. But the thing is, is like, okay, acknowledging, acknowledging like, Hey, you know what? Yeah, I, I do have flaws. I'm not, I'm not Superman. I have kinks in the armor and that's okay. You know? Right. I agree, Sean. Um, and I just want to add also to Austin's point about um, sometimes the shame that goes along with men seeking mental health care of any kind. Uh, you know, if we think of it from a perspective of some of the disparities in, in healthcare and healthcare system and barriers, a lot of it is also, you know, when you don't see uh, clinicians that look like you, act like you, talk like you, you're less likely to want to open up with them, uh, especially about something that there is a degree of shame uh, that that you're carrying with you for many, many years. Um, and I do think that that's, um, you know, when we're designing systems of care, typically you want the providers to look like the population that you're treating. That itself is, is an inherent barrier that you're removing by making sure that if you're even thinking of it from a cultural perspective, if you're treating a, a certain sector of the population or a certain culture, or even in the military, ideally you have um, providers, clinicians, therapists, doctors, dietitians who share some, some background, ideally, right? In the eating disorder world, that's extremely difficult, right? Because we're, I think we're blessed to have so many females, right? So many female therapists. We have a lot of nurturers, which is wonderful. But at the same time, there are a lot of men who may not necessarily feel comfortable coming forward with an eating disorder to a group of group of women because uh, a lot of us I think from a very young age we we're programmed by again this is the media society culture to have uh, put on an image of uh, this uh, we're expected to cope essentially right not just with an eating disorder but with with a lot of a lot of different factors of life right with job stress long work hours with hunger. We're expected to cope without complaining. Um, and that expectation, a lot of sense, and I think it starts from your teenage years is, is well, because I want to look good in front of the girls, right? A lot of men kind of uh, develop with that mindset. I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist, by the way, I'll share that. So, and a lot of us, I think, um, carry that into adulthood, uh, which can be very intimidating to open up in a group setting or in a, even in a private one-on-one -on -one setting to a female clinician. So I think one of the that's certainly one of the barriers that that we can start removing by working to design systems of care that are more male friendly in a sense, right? Uh, and this is why I made the comment about let's not even gender it because, the more gendered language we introduce into this conversation, well, the more it does automatically become kind of female dominant because that is the predominant population that, that struggles with eating disorders. And if we want men to step forward, uh, and I'm sure their, their numbers are underreported and underestimated, we need to use non-gendered language in order to open up the platform for everyone, all genders, all kinds, all cultures, all backgrounds, all ages. Yeah. That is, that is a really good point. Yeah, because uh, if if anything, once we include more gender specific language, we're just furthering the stereotype really at the end of the day. So we need to to have that gender neutral thing to to go back to, to one of the things that Ryan had said, and it, it 
brought me back to a conversation I actually had with my therapist today about how I struggle sometimes to be my authentic self when I'm meeting a stranger or a new person because I'm hiding something. You know, maybe I'm hiding the fact that I battled this eating disorder or I'm hiding the fact that I'm struggling with my sexuality or or something along those lines. And he said to me that there's so much power in just being your authentic self because it helps you find your flock. And I thought that was so cool that if you if you're willing to face that stigma down and be your real self, you'll find the people that you need to support you. Um, so there's there's no need to hide behind that. And I thought that was such a, a powerful statement that kind of resonates with with what we're talking about here. And uh, another thing um, that you were talking about, Sam, is how it starts so young. I had my first experience with the stigma in second grade. And I, I tell this story a lot when I'm speaking with audiences is that I was on the playground having fun with my friends and I got stung by a bee at school. And rather than tell my teacher or tell any of my friends or go to the school nurse, I sat there all day in pain as my finger was swelling and throbbing because I didn't want to be seen as the crybaby. I didn't want to be made fun of by the other boys because at that point, at seven years old, I was already convinced that boys don't cry, that guys can't show their emotions. So I kept it to myself all day long. And to me, that was that first experience with stigma right there. This was with physical pain, but it would just manifest time and time again throughout my life with emotional pain. I would, again, just keep it to myself and suppress it because I was so worried that, that I was going to be judged or outcast by other people. And um, I think that definitely that fueled a lot of my eating disorder was was that belief that I had to just bottle it all up that I couldn't express it. Yeah, J Jason, I want to jump in on that one. Um, so I, again, hit it on the head for me, very similar. It was uh, at a younger age, I think in my teen years, probably in middle school when I first having self-conscious uh, regards towards my weight, uh, knowing that I joined wrestling in high school to help lose weight in, a, in an athletic means and in a way to be healthy. but. Um, through, I think that that constant need uh, to be seen as a male figure who uh, is both in shape and healthy. I've, I've shared before in form that Zach Morris from Saved by the Bell was the figure from TV that I looked forward to. The the cool, thin, you know, male type that was able to flirt and have fun. And I think a massive challenge I dealt with through and and why I, I think I kept my purging hidden for so long was the, the carrot and the stick, the positive incentives. I didn't have an extreme case. I wasn't going through, uh, I did not get hospitalized, thankfully. I never pushed it to that extent. However, uh, I was unhealthy and I was doing things that were causing harm to my body, but I was receiving positive feedback from those around me, specifically pertaining to the way I looked or the health that I was in. And in the back of my head, in, in a non-healthy way, I took that positive feedback that wasn't a positive response to my poor eating choices. It was a positive response to my outward appearance because we're so driven that outward appearance matters in society. And in my head, I translated that to, you know what? It wasn't the running that I did or the sports that I did. Whatever I was, you know, that's the combination of all those things. And a part of that puzzle for me was the eating disorder. And so not intentionally, those that loved, loved me and those that supported me accidentally encouraged me through my convoluted and, 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 and messed up mind to continue that eating disorder that I had. And, I'm, and it's, it's a shame. And, and I think part of that is just this uh, American culture, because I know there's different cultures and different views, but our, uh, the American culture I always grew up in, where we idealize body types and not the inner person. Uh, and, and there's health reasons and there's extremes and, and there's a balance there. But there's a, there's a way to be healthy with different body types. And there's a way to be healthy and go through different challenges. Um, and it'd be nice to be able to break away. And I, and I think media slowly, Disney and, and some other large organizations are, are trying to break some of those stereotypes down. And the more recent shows that I'm showing my children versus the ones I grew up with watching in the 90s, the sitcoms and those things on television. Uh, but it was definitely that middle school and, and junior years that I think I started uh, at least that program in my head that, that there was something that I thought was wrong with me. Yeah. You know, I think it's important too, to jump in. And I think part of the stigma is that it is all about appearance. Um, and me personally, I, mine hasn't been 
nearly as much appearance as, as feeling. I, I love that feeling of that exhaustion and deprivation and the starvation and such. So it's been kind of hard to get people to understand that because so many people, when they hear eating disorder, think of like, oh, well, they're trying to be skinny. And a lot of times with males, it's the opposite. It can actually be men trying to get bigger and eating addictions and things with that kind of kind of nature in hand. Um, so yeah, I think overcoming some of that stigma around uh, appearance driven is really an important thing to, to recognize as well. Yeah, and I, I'm curious with, with this conversation now kind of shifting a little bit, um, where do we factor in what is the expectation of males, both maybe physically, but also when it comes to some of the things that could feel an eating disorder that we have normalized in our society? What are some of those gender norms? We, we see it online nowadays with the gym culture, or the bro culture that is out there all the time. Uh, we see it with bigorexia, or there's a, a lot of individuals out there like myself where it's it manifests in orthorexia, where I wasn't concerned about my body image either, I was concerned more about eating the foods that I thought was going to give me longevity or bring me happiness or healthiness or healthy. And um, I think that is one of the things that we don't talk about a lot with men because we have fixated this appearance issue to eating disorders. And we so often forget the other factors that contribute to it too. Well, I think that's such a great point too. And I know that our focus here is talking about men and eating disorders, males and eating disorders. The thing is, I think that's something that even in, in when providing care for individuals, you're still having trouble we're, as practitioners and clinicians having trouble with clients that are coming in just like, well, but wait, I just want to eat healthy. Like, what's wrong with that? You know, and so I think that's that's a huge part of it as well that can't be ignored is that, wait, there are these social cultural things that are being normalized that necessarily that aren't necessarily going to be the most beneficial for someone long-term and can actually turn someone to getting to a place where it's more self-destructive than, than self-fulfilling or building. Yeah. Do you think it goes unrecognized in men more often because of that stereotype that men don't battle eating disorders? So oftentimes some of those behaviors are more normalized um, among males. I mean, I, I would love to hear what other people think on this too. For me personally, thinking on that, absolutely, I think it is because the same thing. Like, and I love what um, what you said, Dr. Moss, about about like the the that culture and 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 whatnot. Because it's it's so true. It's like okay, if you're if you're out in the gym grinding it out, like that's that's what you do as a guy. Like in high school, you're expected to lift weights, you know, like it's like, and if you don't do that, then it's like, okay, wait, what's wrong with you? Like what? Oh, you're not one of those guys, right? Like you're not one of those kids or whatnot. So I think there's a lot of um, those types of things that get in the way of actually showing like specifically what, what, what's happening under the surface. And there's a lot of that, what Ryan alluded to too, with that like feeling aspect of it, it doesn't necessarily be, it have to be all about okay, you know, I'm trying, I mean, yes, it can be that figure, like whether it's muscle dysmorphia, bigorexia, whatever it is, but still, there's still that it's a process. Like it's a process thing that happens, I think as well with it of like, okay, well this coping, you know, like, okay, I'm going to do X, Y, or Z movement for how long, because it gives me this satisfaction of feeling exhausted or it numbs me out. So I'm not going to be thinking about how I was bullied when I was younger or the fight that I'm having with my partner, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And I think in regard to um, in regard to Jason, your your question also of where does this kind of ideal body image come from? The the messaging I I think it it all starts very young, and um, I hate to vilify the media; uh, it's the source of a lot of issues. But I think this is a big one um, because I hear it from my patients all the time. And now with social media, anything that Hollywood puts out catches fire because now there are TikTok videos of memes from one scene from the movie that gets spread amongst the entire school and the entire County. Uh, but it's, you know, it's every superhero movie. And now we have the Marvel and DC universe and, you know, every superhero movie has, you know, these buff guys that clearly have spent years in the gym, if not, if not more, 
Um, and, you know, all of that, whether we pay attention to it or not, does get be defined, at, even if, if subconsciously, as kind of an ideal body image, right? This is the strong male guy who's going to go save the world and save the universe and has superpowers, right? Um, very rarely do I see, and 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 yes, Austin. Some I think just recently, maybe some companies like Disney may be starting to go in a different direction, but I I still think it's they're the minority, right? And it's still not there across the board. Um, and also this this focus on I think male sports that starts very young from you know high school sports programs being funded way better than any academic department, and then into college right, for athletic programs to be um, really how how even Ivy League schools differentiate themselves, all of that has a, um, has a, a kind of a downstream effect on the culture that exists within the school, the gym culture. You're going to get high fives if you're in the gym every day. Oh, you go to the gym three times a day. Well, then you're the man, right? Um, and if you're in the library, well, like, like, like you said, Sean, Maybe you're not the man, right? Maybe you don't. You no longer fit what we uh, believe to be the ideal male, even personality. Forget just body image, right? Your head is not in the right place, and this starts from a very young age, right? I have kids who feel shame because they like to read, and this starts in first grade, right, where they're get, they, they, they're made fun of because oh, you don't like to play football or you don't like to do tackle this and that. So, and and uh, by the way. I love sports, right? This is this is not a commentary on sports in general. It's what we are prioritizing for the younger generation that ends up essentially leading to some level of programming in their mind. And this is why I always coach parents on um, monitoring what their you know what is the the social media diet that their kids are on, right? Or even you know, all right, don't just give them the Netflix account. You need to still be involved on in what they're viewing on Netflix or on Disney or on HBO, whatever, because, or on YouTube, right? Where now you have an algorithm that's feeding you. You watch one bodybuilding video and now you're going to, you know, you're going to watch the biography of Arnold all the way until, you know, <laughs> all the bodybuilders that ever existed. And that's it. And that, that becomes maybe, you know, sixth grade. That's all. That was your mentality for sixth grade. This is who I need to become. And this is how it starts. And it, it doesn't take much else for it to become um, an eating disorder, right? All it takes is some positive feedback. Sometimes it's just one friend, one family member, and then the, the fire has been has been caught and it spreads. Yeah, I think something that has to be alluded to uh, right now also is looking at the other side of that. And, and some of the work that I've been doing around awareness has has really opened up my eyes with the younger generation of middle schoolers and high schoolers right now is the transgender issues. And yeah, there's there's definitely, I, I kind of got into the eating disorder via the athletic issues and so forth that we've been talking about now. But uh, golly, one of the things that's just just going crazy that I'm, I'm seeing in schools that I'm working with are, yeah, transgender youth that are using the eating disorder to kind of change their physique in that regard. So yeah, that's a that's another area to kind of kind of just gain an awareness of, and and it shows the wide spectrum that we're we're looking at right now. So, yeah, kind of kind of interesting. I wanted to follow up on Dr. Moss's comment um, with the information, uh, the social media, which is a big challenge, and I think another aspect of that is uh, the access to accurate and uh, correct or informed research inf medical information. And I've done a lot of uh, work looking into this topic. We have so much information, we're information overload now in the, uh, with what our children and what we have access to, and especially now with, with AI bots coming out, uh, the, the need for generating more information is out there and looking into that. I think a, a very big challenge uh, is where can I go to get true, good, timely, and healthy information about what it means to be, uh, you know, what is a healthy gym experience? What is a healthy nutrition or diet for my body type or my need? What is the right amount of time for my goals? And, and am I getting that right from the right person? Because uh, you watch one video 
and it may have some information that may present some results in a, in a potentially healthy or unhealthy manner. And then for every one video out there, there's another video that contradicts that one and says, that's not the right, right way to go, or here's another way to do it. You hone in on the one that works well for you, thinking that's the, the best means to, to get or achieve your goals. Uh, and then as uh, you alluded to, once you, once you hone in on one, the, those algorithms are designed to program to feed you more of that same type of thing. And so a big challenge there is uh, how do we ensure that those people out there uh, that are looking to get help who are seeking help, probably the first thing they're going to go to is the internet, whether that's a Google search or some other location. And how does, you know, how do those sites and those uh, engines ensure that the information provided them is researched, accurate, uh, and, and, uh, and correct. And that's a, it's a challenge that we just, we face in this current generation. It's one that my children are going to have to live through and learn how to, um, figure out on their own. Growing up, we didn't have the internet. Uh, I had to go to the library, look through encyclopedia and for something for information to get, make it to a book to get published. Uh, there was a lot of extra steps that needed to go through. So I could relatively trust some of that information and, I think the challenge now is you can just go online, find an article, it sounds about right, and you just trust it at face value. And you may be getting some very unhealthy information from that. What I like about this panel is we at least are a diverse group of five, while not being a large number, five is still a decent number of individuals with different backgrounds. And so those listening hopefully can get some different perspectives to point them in a general direction. And so I appreciate this type of, this type of forum for getting some information out there. That that's a really good point too, because I was thinking about it on social media all the time. I will see guys who are quote unquote eating disorder recovery coaches. And then the next thing you know, they're posting these triggering before and after photos, or you're saying to do X, Y, and Z, and this is going to heal you. And I think it's so important that we, we do exactly what you're saying, Austin, is that we realize there are so many different approaches. No two recoveries are ever going to look the same. No, no two eating disorders are ever gonna look the same. So it's so important to get that help from a professional and not rely on social media, but unfortunately, Unfortunately, nowadays we're, we're so subjected to it. When I search for hashtag men's mental health on social media, more often than not, most of the pictures are shirtless guys in the gym showing off their abs or their biceps or something. I don't know how that relates necessarily to mental health because if anything, it's bad for my mental health because it fuels those insecurities and that the body image concerns that I have. So it's really important that we do, we filter social media um, and, and make sure that there's healthy boundaries. Um, a lot of people will post content on there, not meaning for it to do harm to other people, but it actually does. So I think it's so important that we, we promote those boundaries when it comes to what we share on social media and what we take in, what we consume on social media too. That's a very tough one, Austin. And, and, you know, I think we all probably deal with the consequences of this information overload to some extent every day. Um, I, I, I mean, personally, I always, when I'm asked this question, I like to uh, encourage the individual to take a course in critical thinking, <laughs> even if, even if they've already graduated and it's, you know, it's way past, you know, a school time, I would just focus on critical thinking so that regardless of the source of information, you're able to separate any potential, um, you know, monetary incentive that the source might have. The marketing machine is very sneaky. Um, individuals have a lot of personal interests that, you know, they might go on a podcast and, and share sometimes. Uh, individuals curate pieces of information that really, it's really um, just validating what they already believe. And, and then they essentially sell that to a, uh, because they want to feel further validated. And you really have to be critical with everything that comes your way these days. Um, generally speaking, I think sticking with non-for-profit public health entities is a safe place to start. Not that they're perfect, but it's generally a safe place to start simply because usually in order for them to receive funding, they have to do some level of due diligence and they have to um, be informed of um and data, data that applies to um, kind of wider populations. It's not because my cousin responded well to this one treatment that it works. It's because it worked in 
millions of individuals or we did large clinical trials and that's how that's how I can justify even talking about this one treatment. It's not because of an anecdotal um, experience that I had. Um, and if I'm if I have a great marketing department, that one anecdotal experience might be the next best thing that that's on the shelves. And this is where it's dangerous, right? And and the same I'm, I, I'm sure applies to um, the topic that, that we're discussing today. Yeah, all right. Well, um, I wanted to transition it into a couple more topics here before we run out of time at the top of the hour. And uh, the next thing that I was really looking forward to discussing tonight, and it's one of those things where I'm just going to throw the word out, the words out there and see what your response is. So I'd love to hear from all the panelists. But what comes to mind when you hear toxic masculinity? I, I think of kind of locker room culture, right? Things that... Um, some guys talk about when they feel that they're kind of in a in a quote unquote safe space where um, they can get away with things that they may not say in front of their mother. That's mm -hmm. that's toxic <laughs> toxic masculinity for me. And this is unique to my experiences. That word drives home workaholic. Uh, my dad was is a very strong worker. There's positives to that, but when you do it too much, that it hurts relationships. That's not good, but most of the toxic individuals of the male gender that I work with, uh, for me, it's that that need to be able to work at all hours, at all times, uh, and to not complain about that, which relates, you know, transitions to stress, to other issues, which then uh, manifest in, in other issues, which me specifically, that stress and anxiety uh, limited my control over aspects of my life which manifested in my eating disorder. So uh, for me, that workaholic culture for toxic masculinity is where, where it triggers home. Funny, it just opened my perspective just hearing you both share on that because um, initially like my, my knee jerk reaction is to think about um, maltreatment of other people, taking advantage of other people. Um, that's what I think of with toxic masculinity, but that, that's like my initial thought. That's my knee jerk reaction. But then Austin and Dr. Moss here and you guys share that. Um, it makes me think of how pervasive it can be in the different realms, especially like what you, what you just shared Austin with like the work, that work culture, there's that toxicity that can come in that actually leads over to other aspects of life and then how that what, what are the downstreams i'm thinking of upstream and downstream effect of it great and uh ryan did you have uh have some thoughts on on that word on those two words <laughs> yeah uh gosh toxic masculinity um that's a hard one uh I guess for me, it's more uh, kind of a personal, uh, yeah, I want to say more of a shame for the man that I don't feel I am. And, and mine's more so like the 90s sitcom guy, like Jerry, Jerry Seinfeld or the, the guys from Friends, like these guys that just, just don't care about any of the things that I wake up anxious and a half about. I mean, it's, uh, so, so I, I really have never ascribed to the the toxic masculinity in terms of like big muscly guy intense workaholic mine is much more so just an anger at myself and and toxic I mean toxic synonymous with like poison or so it's almost just like this poison I put in myself of this this thing that I'm not able to do because of my anxiety and the obsessiveness over over things that I feel these happy-go-lucky sitcom guys would never experience. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that's toxic for me. I definitely take a different note on that one. Interesting. Uh, may I make a comment on that, uh, Jason? To, to Ryan's yeah. comment. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, this is not a, a, an attack on on Jerry Seinfeld, the person. Jerry Seinfeld, yeah. the character portrayed in the in the uh, the sitcom. I, you know what? As you mentioned that, uh, and I love the show. And, and the, the conclusion of the show exemplified that concept of those individuals were not the best people out there. 
I'd say it's a very good example of, a, in my eyes, of a toxic a male figure, a person who sincerely goes through life doing the things that benefit them as an individual without a lack of concern for anyone outside of their personal bubble. And with re- regards to that character as portrayed in the show, while be it funny at times, it was a sitcom that was successful. To go through life uh, doing what is beneficial to you without the concern or needs of others uh, and just to kind of wash it off, I think that's a very toxic type of individual uh, mentality. And it's, you know, if you don't think about it that way, putting that perspective on it, I think does paint a new type of look at when we say toxic in the sense of an individual, it can manifest many different ways. It can, it can come mm-hmm. out different ways. Um, so I think, I think that was a good example. Yeah, that is, it's really cool to hear everybody's perspective on this because it is, it's one of those things that I've seen talking about mental health in men that, that word is off or that phrase is often thrown around and it's just tossed around out there. And I think we do, we all kind of have different definitions of exactly what toxic masculinity is. For me, it's one of those things where I try to make it clear to folks when I'm, when I'm talking about it, that masculinity in itself is not toxic. It's not inherently toxic. It becomes toxic when we start to push norms on other people. When we try to tell them you have to act this way in order to be a guy. And to me, that's when it really becomes toxic. When we're saying you have to follow this rule book, this unwritten rule book that seems to be passed down from generation of generation to men, um, that's when it becomes toxic. Um, That there are going to be some guys who are more masculine than others. And there's going to be some guys who are more feminine than others. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not toxic either way. It becomes toxic when we, when we start to push it um, on other people. And I I think one way that it can manifest, especially with eating disorders and uh, Frankie in the chat mentioned this is around bullying, especially in uh, childhood. We will see a lot of toxic masculinity kind of manifest itself um, in the form of bullying uh, in school where kids are picking on somebody else because they're different and because they're not like they are. And um, I think it causes a lot of um, eating disorders later in life. Yeah. All right. So um, we're going to wrap this up. We got about 10 minutes to go here. Uh, I want to focus this last part of the session on treatment. So we've talked a lot about the problems tonight. How, what are some of the solutions now? Um, I'm curious what, for those with lived experience, what worked for you in the treatment process? What didn't work for you? And for those with the clinical side, well, what do you see when working with men? What, what is successful? What needs to be changed? What can we do moving forward to make treatment more accessible and more effective for males? Hey, hey Jason, this is Austin. Um, wh- I'd highly encourage uh, if there's someone in your life that you feel comfortable with, it doesn't have to be your partner, your significant other, it could be a friend. And sometimes that distant friend that you can talk with that you just innately trust, who is not in your personal day-to-day life is also a great confidant to have because there's some distance there. I think it really helped me to have at least one person that I could share with as a support structure, but if you're not able to immediately go to, to seek out a professional to get behavioral health, not everyone has the funds, the resources, the health coverage, or the location to get the behavioral health. Um, but finding that support structure because it's it's challenging sometimes to make that first phone call, to make that first appointment. If possible, I do recommend uh, to if you're concerned about your health, even in, in a minor, minor issue, and if you're not concerned uh, to just get that daily that, that checkup. We do annual health checkups. We check for certain things at certain stages of life. If you've never got in for a behavioral health checkup, it, it may just be time just as that touch point to do that. But the, the one thing I will recommend on that note is Everyone is different. Um, we, we talked about it earlier that having someone you feel comfortable with as a provider that looks like you, talks like you, it, it, sometimes that appeals to others. Sometimes people want that different gender perspective. But I will encourage anyone out there, if your first experience with a behavioral health provider, you just don't feel comfortable, it doesn't feel like it's, it's just, it's not for you. I'd, I'd challenge you and encourage you and invite you to try at least one other provider. And that's because we're all, we're all people. We all, we're all people, and you, you may have sat down with the best provider in the world at any other day, but they may have had just a bad experience, or it's the end of the day, and they, as an individual, just happen to be stressed. Or maybe you just don't connect with them. 
but don't write off the seeking of behavioral health or that care from a, from a one experience. I'd challenge you to at least invite you to try at least one other person um, and maybe a different type of a provider. There's a lot of great, I like cognitive behavioral therapists for me. Some people like different type of therapy. It, it, sometimes it's group therapy, but I'd, I'd encourage you to try one, two, three before, before it's written off. Um, I know many people that tried once, they wrote it off and, and they have no interest in going back and it's, 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 it's challenging. So I work with them on at least inviting them that. Thank you for sharing that, Austin. Um, I, I would say from from the clinical perspective, um, I, I think you know we need to be doing a better job of um, communicating the message that when there is uh, a form of trauma or something like an eating disorder, which is very usually very closely linked to a form of trauma, when an individual takes that first step to seeking help as Austin uh, was suggesting, it can be extremely transformative and empowering. Um, and I think Jason, you shared this experience, just how empowering your experience was for you. I think we need to be doing a better job of essentially communicating that message to provide motivation and encouragement. And we're not doing that if uh, the face of eating disorders is female, right? Uh, we need to be able to add more diversity to the, um, again, systems of care. All colors, all types, all genders. There can't be uh, the stereotype of, well, this is the person that we expect would have an eating disorder. We need to introduce um, faces and mentors. And it's just like, you know, when you seek out a mentor, it's usually someone that you feel like, hey, you know what? I might have something in common with them. We need to have uh, kind of that same mentality injected into the healthcare system that's that's there to treat these conditions so that the individual is able to take that first step and feel empowered to really confront and address something that's potentially been affecting them for years or for however uh at length of time i think that's the biggest challenge and the more we have these conversations and the more just simply talking about it, the more that kind of change will happen. And I do think we're early in that process right now, but it will get better. We just need to keep at it and keep having these talks. Yeah. As far as, as, far as treatment goes in my life, it's it's been kind of interesting. I think I've gone through the whole spectrum of it from, gosh, anywhere from psychedelics for, for therapy to... Uh, inpatient care to residential care. Uh, and you know that the thing that's kind of helped me the most actually is I, I currently co-manage a sobriety home and diving in with the addiction community, the addiction recovery community has been the most therapeutic thing in my life. And living at the house as, as a resident, as well as a counseling presence uh, has really helped. And it was yeah, it was so long coming that I was just searching for a community of which to recover in. And yeah, they, I mean, the eating disorder treatment protocols and whatnot, as we kind of alluded, can be, yeah, these, some of these are kind of like for-profit businesses and they're very kind of cookie cutter. And But when I all of a sudden realized that I was welcome in the local NA meeting and the local AA meeting and that our paths really kind of painted a parallel structure and I could sit there and talk to the opium addict about the feeling that we get from runners high as well as 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 Vicodin and we could agree on things and support each other in our treatment uh, and it was actually really great because one of the other things that happens with an eating disorder is I'm sure that many of us are well aware of and it's alluded to in this whole gym culture phenomenon is the essence of competition and that's a lot of times why eating disorder support groups can get a little tense as we compete with one another. So, yeah, the other thing that opened up via going to these AA, NA, and so forth meetings where I, I wasn't competing with these individuals around eating disorder. I wasn't in the back of my mind saying who could go to the gym more often or who could, because we had we had parallel but different paths. So, yeah, I think that's a really valuable thing that we can start looking at in, in the treatment 
kind of kind of spectrum is to to equate this to more familiar, less stigmatized things. And the stigma is a real big thing too, because it's like, yeah, you go to Thanksgiving dinner and you're not able to eat mashed potatoes. You're kind of looked at with a weird eye. Nobody quite understands it. But Uncle Frank, who can't have wine because he is five years sober of of alcohol, gets a round of applause by turning down a glass of wine. Uh, so it's kind of an interesting thing of how we we approach these topics as well. It goes back to, but yeah, that's two cents right there. So yeah, thinking thinking of what everybody shared, such helpful responses, and I, I, I my mind, it's it. I'm I'm having trouble for myself with like thinking of like okay, when someone is getting access to care or when they are in care of what that of what that might look like and how you know, how we can help with that. And I think with the access, like what, what others have said, and I don't mean to repeat stuff, but it's, I think it's really important that these conversations are out there. I'm, I'm, I, when I hear of, um, oh, you guys might be able to tell me his name. One of the actors that recently came out, he did, they did the, he did the Netflix documentary Stutz, I think. What's uh, that, that actor, um, I forgot his name. I forgot what he, what he was, but he was talking about some of the stigma that, that he experienced and his mental health stuff, but also too, just around body stuff. Jonas, Jonas, what's his name? Um, you guys yeah, Jonah Hill. Jonah Hill, Jonah Hill. There you yeah, go. Jonah, Jonah Hill. Hill. Yeah. Talking about like some of those things of like, you know, cause he was, the, the media was very critical of, of him. And so my point is of bringing that up is again, having, having these conversations, making it more accessible. Um, for people. And that's what I think is great about this opportunity here is that this is this is a free thing. This isn't something that anybody had to pay for. Yes, there is privilege involved in it because of internet access, computer, all that. However, it's just it's something where, okay, let's let's use every resource we have available because it's 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 that important. So I think getting access, making it making it more of a, hey, it's okay to speak out on it. And, I, and that's one thing I just wanted to say thank you to to Austin and Ryan for you guys talking out and Jason too for for speaking out about that and even Dr. Moss talking about your experience with the gym culture and 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 whatnot like that's I think that's helpful to for people to know like okay wait I'm not isolated I'm I'm not the I'm not the green th- not green like sore thumb I'm not the one sticking out right like it's like okay wait a sec there's there is a there is some somebody else out there that's having similar thoughts I'm not a I'm not a freak show or whatever you know so that's what I think of. I mean, it, we could we could continue the conversation. I know we're at time, but there's there's a lot there's a lot there. I think with with access to care, and then also when in care, how we can how we can because I think there's an owner there's an ownership that we need to take on as being a client too of of what Austin said. Hey, don't give up after that that first shot, and ask questions. If you're going to seek someone, ask them. Hey, how would you treat me differently considering of these things that I'm bringing? to this if you're if you're feeling that vulnerable to talk with them but you can ask those questions that's okay i would encourage that yeah yeah all right well this is a a great place to to wrap up and and just to speak to that last point one more time i reached out to almost 20 therapists when i was starting my recovery journey until i finally made that match and i just had to keep trying and there was some tough days along the way that I thought I was never going to heal or that I wasn't worthy of treatment or strong enough for for recovery, but I had to keep going and I just had to keep going back until I found that right fit. And then it all just clicked. So it's it's one of those things to, to keep going. And for anybody out there who might be a male who's battling an eating disorder or knows a male who's battling an eating disorder, Anna does have a free virtual support group. I lead it. I help facilitate it every other Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern time and or at 7 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, I, I had a, a guy the other day in the group say that he had never felt so seen and heard in a support group until he was finally in a group with males. He said he'd been to so many other groups where he was the only guy and being able to be in that space uh, around other people who he could identify with uh, was really helpful in his recovery. And I thought that that was so cool to to hear that. Um, But definitely uh, check out our website for a full lineup of the support groups that we have going on. And and Sean, how can uh, folks connect with within? 
Yeah, you can go to withinhealth.com and that will, there's a, we have some um, accessible things there that can connect you with people. So please, yeah, check out the website. If you're looking for treatment, um, go there, fill out the form and we'll more than happy to connect with you guys. Awesome. And there is a wonderful resource page on the Within Health site for men with eating disorders uh, from your uh, conference last year, from the summit last year. Uh, it, it, yeah, incredible resource. So I uh, highly recommend that folks in the audience check that out. Well, Austin, Ryan, Sam, Sean, I want to thank all of you for, for showing up tonight and for sharing your stories. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, Ryan, can you give us the name of your book one more time so that folks can check it out if they're interested? Yeah, no, that would be fantastic. Uh, so the book is called From Emaciated to Emancipated, uh, The Story of a Skinny Mango. Mango is a crazy old nickname. And uh, and I would love to talk to any of you guys. So uh, yeah, feel free to, to reach out anytime. Uh, once again, my website's just thesurfingmango.com. And uh, yeah, it would be a blast. Uh, I'm super into the whole spirituality and eating disorder kind of vibe. Um, yeah, and just love conversation. So don't oh. hesitate. All right. Awesome. And then Austin, he has that blog post up on the Anid blog. So definitely check that out. Um, yeah. And with that, I think we will go ahead and uh, wrap up this conversation, but I think we're just getting started. I hope this is the first of many conversations that we can get together because I still have so many questions um, for all of you. So uh, for everybody that attended tonight, thank you so much for, for stopping by. And again, to the panelists, thank you so much for an awesome conversation. Hope everyone has a great night. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Jason. It's been a pleasure. Bye, guys. Have a good one.